Well, good morning, UCM. It's good to see you all here on this rainy weekend to come and worship the Lord together. And if you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know we are in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we are in the chapter of chapter 13. And so if you have a Bible this morning, open to that, or if you've got a tablet, pull it out and uh, get ready to uh, read along with us as we continue our study in 1 Corinthians. But Anybody been challenged over the last few weeks? Uh, anybody been uh, sort of brought uh, some things to your attention about the Word of God and how it has impacted us? You know, this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we, we, we started off thinking, you know, it's such a lovely chapter. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is all these things. That, and we feel so good about that, that we put it on cards. We hang it on our walls in our homes. And yet, as we come to examine this text more closely, and we begin to hold it up to ourselves, we, we, we realize that we're walking through some landmines here. That every time we bring up a new characteristic of love, love is patient, oh, there's an explosion around us. And, and, and it, if we hold it up to ourselves and we say, am I really being patient? Am I really encompassing and embodying the love of agape on the way of agape? Do I need some transformation in my life? And, and we see as we measure ourselves up of what love really is that, in fact, agape can be quite challenging. And so this morning... Some good news and some bad news. The good news is we're going to continue to learn about love <laughs> and hopefully be transformed in the way of love. The bad news for some of us, uh, again, this morning is that there will be some things that will challenge us and that we need to allow the Lord to work in our lives and say, Lord, this morning, would you speak to me that I may be transformed into the way of agape? Let's agree to that together and ask him to do that this morning as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you knowing that you are the good, good Father. And we are asking, Lord, this morning as you speak to us through this text in 1 Corinthians that you would challenge us, that you would just, uh, Lord, speak deeply into our lives, that we would become people of transformation, people of agape, Lord. Let us all just hear your word this morning in your name. Amen. Well, uh, Last week, I had one of those good father moments. My uh, son came down the stairs with a brand new toy. It was a little airplane, and, and he was flying it around. He said, Dad, I just walked through the door, and he said, Dad, look what I got, this new airplane, and he's flying it around. I said, well, where'd you get that, Malachi? And Ellie, my daughter, was right behind him, and she said, I bought it for him, Dad. I said, well, wow, that's great. That, that's wonderful. You got to know something about my kids, okay? My son is strong-willed and stubborn, okay? My daughter is controlling. <laughs> you get strong-willed and stubborn and controlling together, what do you have? Uh, you, whether it's with children or adults, it's dynamite. <laughs> it's waiting for an explosion to happen. And so when I heard this, my heart just melts, you know. Ah, uh, but man, Ellie bought him a brand new toy. Malachi is happy. And I said, Ellie, that's great. And she said to me, she said, Dad, I figured I needed to be a better sister, so I bought him a toy. I thought, oh, wow, that warms the father's heart. Fifteen minutes they were fighting again. But, uh... <laughs> You know, it's that moment where we go, oh, that's great. I love to hear that. And as I heard those words, I thought, you know, that's the agape way, the way of otherness. If we could somehow say, Lord, I need to be a better follower of Jesus, and so I need to think of someone else. I think that's what we're talking about this morning when we're talking about the way of agape and the traits that Paul is going to identify here this morning. He is identifying a life that says that this life is not all about me, but it is about considering the needs, the wants, the desires, the hurts, the things that offend other people, and adjusting my life to meet those needs. If we could somehow integrate that into our lives, we would be following this road on the way of agape. And that's what we want to do this morning because oftentimes in our culture today, it is all about the self. In fact, if you look at our vocabulary, I looked up, there are over 130 self-words. Did you know that? I, I looked it up this week. You've got things like 
self-help, self-love, self-advancement, self-examination, self-expression, on and on. You know what I don't see in our vocabulary a whole lot of? Otherness words. And yet if you look in the scripture 59 times, there are what I call the one another phrases. 59 times in the Bible, the Bible mentions that if we are on the way of agape, if we are in the way of the Lord, we will be considering one another. We need to be on the way of otherness. And so this morning, I want to draw your attention to the otherness part of the way of agape. Let's look at what it says. Go down to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's read it together. It says, love is patient and kind. We looked at that the first week. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. We looked at those last week and this week. Love is not rude. Okay? We know the drill. If you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, we know how we do this. First of all, I say Jesus is not rude. I include my name. Chad is not rude. Now it's your turn on three. Insert your own name. One, two, three. Ever. <laughs> are we ever rude? Do, do you, are you ever, I mean, some of you, I see it. You're laughing. You're hitting the person next to you. Because that's really it's oftentimes not part of our DNA. We, we are prone to rudeness at times. And in fact, the Greek phrase here could literally be translated, love does not act inappropriately. See, Christian love does not seek to cause problems in the relationships around us. And so, it has manners. See, part of the purpose of manners is to reduce the friction in human interaction. And discourtesy or lack of manners reveals a lack of consideration for others. Rudeness, if we stop and, and sort of break it down and really think about it, rudeness really is quite a selfish act that says, I'm going to do what I want to do without in consideration for otherness. In fact, I read an article not that long ago written by Meryl Marcoe in the Wall Street Journal. And, and she uh, writes an article called The Renaissance of Rudeness saying that rudeness is becoming more and more common in our society. And she points to, and this is where we will all perhaps be a little bit convicted this morning, cell phones. <laughs> cell phones is a, uh, an indicator of our rising rudeness. In fact, she goes on to say, you know, cell phones are everywhere. You're in a movie theater. The phone rings. Have you ever done this and somebody picks up the phone and starts talking as you're watching a movie? Not in consideration of the other 150 people in the movie theater, but, hey, I've got this phone call and I have to take it right now. That is purely a selfish act. I was at a funeral not that long ago. I was doing the funeral and somebody's phone rang and they started talking on their phone in the middle of a funeral. And how disrespectful. That is so self-absorbed. At church sometimes, oh, wait, wait, pastor, now, don't, don't, don't bring it to church. Sometimes people start talking on their cell phones. She, she mentioned in particular a lady who was on a train and was in a sleeping cart and talked for 16 hours straight after being told multiple times by passengers and the conductor to stop. And she refused to do it. She was eventually hauled off of the, uh, the train by police officers, all the while complaining, it's my right to speak on the phone. That's just it, though, isn't it? That oftentimes our mentality, it's my right to do what I want to do, and if it hurts you, that's your problem. Let me tell you, that is number one, it's rude, and it's not the way of otherness, and it's not really the way of agape. See, we need to be considerate of other individuals, and the ill-mannered person is communicating that this is all about me. Love by contrast. It's not going to be selfish for the simple reason that love is concerned with other people's well-being. Therefore, love is mannerly. Love is not rude. And in the Corinthian church, the church of Corinth had a problem with rudeness. Now, what I've discovered is you know, there's nothing new under the sun. It, it, you, you, the problems that we have in church today were problems that existed 2,000 years ago. So we aren't the first ones to go through these problems. But in the Corinthian church, they had a problem with rudeness. In fact, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is, this is how rude they were. 
They were overindulging in the feast. The people who were eating, some people were stuffing themselves Well, other people were going hungry. It would be like the church having a big potluck and those in the front were piling up their plate this high and then the people in the back of the line, they got up to the place where the food is at and there is no food left. Would you not say that that is rude? (laughs) Of course that's rude. And Paul says, what are you doing? That's not the way of agape. In fact, also it talks about in chapter 12 that they were in the church service And there were people talking over one another because they wanted to be heard, not allowing the other individuals to be heard. That is the way of rudeness. There was another instance where there were people that were going to feasts that were incredibly offensive to other people. And they would go to this feast and say, I went to this feast and we had a good time and it was great and I loved it. These other people were horrified that they would go to such a feast. But they didn't have any consideration for other people's feelings. Listen, as a body of Christ, as a member of the body of Christ, that's not the way of agape. The way of agape is constantly considering the emotions and the feelings of other people. Listen to how Paul even puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 32 and 33, he says, don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles. Don't be rude. Don't be offensive. I know that they're different than you. I know they have different practices than you. Don't be offensive. Look at what he says. He says, I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others that many may be saved. Did you hear that phrase right there? I do what is best for what? Others. That's the way of otherness. That's the way of agape, getting consideration for other individuals. My, uh, when I was a pastor in California, my, one of the greatest people I've worked with was a youth pastor friend of mine. And man, he just had a heart for people. And he had tattoos everywhere. Right? He was just a tattooed kind of guy. And uh, we would go to different parts of admissions trips. And and there are places in the world where tattoos are incredibly offensive, especially to the church. And and we would go to places in Mexico where it would be incredibly hot. And we would have these work projects. And we would all be sweating. I'd have a short sleeve shirt on and shorts. And we'd be shoveling and we'd be digging. But he always wore these long sleeve shirts and long pants. And and I asked him, I said, hey, what, what are you doing? He said, I know that tattoos are offensive here, so I would rather sweat and be uncomfortable than offend my brothers and sisters. That's the way of agape, considering the other individuals among us. Are you walking in the way of agape, in the way of otherness, in this life that we're living, in this calling, in this journey of faith? Number one on your outline, jot it down if you would this morning. If I'm living The way of agape, or the agape way, I will consider the feelings and perspectives of others. I'm going to be considering the feelings and the perspective of others so as not to offend them, to not be rude, to be concerned about their needs and their desires and their wants. Let's look at what it says next. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now we look at verse 5, the next verb here. It says here, love does not insist on its own way. So, I'll say Chad doesn't insist on his own way. Jesus doesn't insist on his own way. Your turn. One, two, three. Okay. Quick poll. Quick survey of UCM. Who here likes getting their own way? Raise your hand. (laughs) Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're liars. (laughs) We all love getting our own way, don't we? I mean, that is just, it just, this is totally counterintuitive. Now, here is the thing. It doesn't say that you should not want to get your own way. It says what? That you should not insist on getting your own way. It's one thing to want your own way, But it is another to sacrifice that and say, 
I want my own way, but for the sake of otherness, I will not insist on my own way. And because we want our own way, we all have to know that we have a propensity, we might not have a love problem, but we have a propensity towards selfishness, and we need to be aware that from time to time, this insisting on our own way creeps up in our relationships with other individuals. Again, this was a big problem in the church of Corinth. In fact, if you go to the chapter one, right out of the first chapter, Paul is addressing the issue of insisting on your own way. There were three pastors. One's name was Apollos, one was Paul, and one was Cephas, or Peter. And there were people in the congregation saying, oh, I want Paul to be my pastor, or I want Cephas to be my pastor, or I want uh, Apollos to be my pastor. And they were all insisting that so-and-so was their pastor. It would be like at Union Church. People here saying, no, I don't want Chad to be the pastor. I want Noah to be the pastor. And if Noah's not the pastor, I'm out. Or no, Chad and Noah, they don't know what they're doing. Charlie was our guy. He knew what he was doing. And, And sort of insisting and demanding that instead of saying, let's just let what other people's desires are, let's yield to that and allow them to make some decision and what's helpful for them. And so there was this insisting on its own way. And and even later on in the chapter, we see in chapter 14, they were demanding what church should look like and what should be done in church, right? We don't ever do that anymore, do we? Well, we've got to have this program and we've got to do this and church has to have this and church has to have that. And and if it doesn't have that, I'm, I'm not going to be happy. Instead of thinking of what's good for other people, we were only thinking about what was good for ourselves. And and Paul says that is not the way of agape. That's not what should be in the body of Christ. That's not what should be in our walk with the Lord. In fact, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, Paul says this. He says, for though I am free from all I have made, uh, from all, I have made myself a slave to all. That's a strong statement. If you make our slave to another individual, you are really surrendering your desires. And notice what the next verse says. It says, 1 Corinthians 10, 24. He says, let no one seek his own good, but what? The good of his neighbor, the good of others. Not thinking what's best for me, not insisting on my way, but really thinking about what is better for other individuals. Sounds like someone who is not always seeking their own way or their desire. This means if I am a person of agape, I'm not going to demand my own way in my marriage, men and women. Do you realize if if we could get this principle down in the church, I would have a lot less marriage counseling to do as a pastor. If, If men and women didn't insist on their own ways, if I could get this principle down in my friends, with my coworkers, and in my church. And in fact, you know, Peter takes it even further in uh, the churches of Asia Minor that he writes his letter to. He actually uses the word submit over and over again. Now, this word submit is scary to a lot of people, right? We, we don't like to hear that word submit. He starts off by saying you need to submit to Christ. And all of us here would say, oh yeah, I love to submit to Christ. That sounds good. But it's totally theoretical, right? Yeah, we're going to submit. And yeah, pastor, I I, want to be a good Christian, so I'm going to submit. But then he takes it even further. He says, okay, if you're going to submit to Christ, you will submit to human institutions like governments. But I didn't vote for that man. (laughs) He's not my president, he, he's not the person I, I, I no, I don't, I don't agree with him. I don't have to submit to that. And then he even says, you need to submit to your employers. Oh, you don't know who my boss is, Pastor. <laughs> oh. So we like this word submit in certain contexts, but then when we actually bring it into what we're supposed to submit to, it becomes a little more challenging. And then here's the one that's really challenging. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Whoa, <laughs> I don't like that one. Us men, we love that one, right? We, we love that one. But if we love that one, that shows us what, men? We've got a problem here with love. If we're boasting in that, say, hey, you know what? I, wives, submit to your husband. There, there is an issue. You know, Paul even says, wives, submit to your husbands. And so us men, we like to celebrate that. But what we forget is before Paul says, wives, submit to your husband, there's a little verse that we often overlook. 
In Ephesians, turn your Bibles there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. He says right before he says, wives, submit to your husbands, what does he say here? Submit to one another. Husbands, before you go around saying submit, read this one. Right? That in the way of agape, it's not about lording over someone ever. It is about the way of otherness. Husbands, you should embrace the way of otherness when it comes to your wives. Wives, you should embrace the way of otherness when it comes to husbands. The Bible says in the body of Christ, we need to yield and we need to submit to one another. What is Paul saying there? It says we need to consider the way of otherness when it comes to people in the body of Christ. Now, there's, there's this in, in New England. My wife and I used to live in New England in the United States. There's all these bridges And you cross these bridges and they're narrow and there's only enough space for one car to go across. And each side of the bridge, there is what is called a yield sign. It means that you are to wait for the other person on the other side. So it's always interesting. You come there and there's two cars coming at the same time and they both say yield. This is the way of otherness. Where you are looking across the bridge and saying, come across And the other person is looking and saying, come across. Now, in the Philippines, if that was the case, you'd both put the gas pedal and slam and collide in the middle, right? (laughs) That's how it works. Like, who can get across first? Or, Or you'd try and squeeze in by each other and see if you can make your way. But the way of otherness is where we're looking across to the person and saying, I'm yielding to you. Come. And the other person is saying, I'm yielding to you, come. That is the way of agape in the body of Christ. That should be the way of agape in your marriage when we start thinking about how we are to love one another in the context of marriage. See, I put number two on your outline. If you're following along this morning, if I am living the agape way, I won't demand my way. I'm not going to be constantly demanding my way, that I get my way. I'm going to give up those rights from time to time. I am going to yield to one another in the body of Christ. I'm going to yield to my spouse. I'm going to yield to my friends. I'm going to yield to the government. I'm going to be in the process of submitting. As I submit to Christ, I'm submitting to others. Notice, let's look at the next characteristic. Our third characteristic this morning. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That comes up. It says, love is not irritable. Love is not irritable. So let's, let's look at this together. Let's talk about Chad is not irritable. Jesus is not irritable. Let's put your name in. One, two, three. Not irritable. I saw some people over there nudging each other. I don't know about that. <laughs> You're not irritable ever, right? We're we're not irritable individual. Is that true for you when you say that? When you are hungry, you're not irritable. My wife calls it being hangry. Have you heard that phrase? Angry and hungry together. You know, when you're hungry, you sort of let the anger element come out, being hangry. When you come home and you're tired from a long day's work, not irritable. When people you work with are obnoxious, not irritable. One of my friends posted online not that long ago on Facebook. I thought it was perfect. Lord, I think I'm getting tired. Help me not to tell people what I think of them today. <laughs> Another friend sent me this picture right here, up here, uh, where it says, when someone really irritates you, do not allow yourself to react by punching them in the face. Instead, step back, take three slow, deep breaths, and remind yourself you are in control. Then step forward and punch them in the face. You will be more accurate and they won't expect it. (laughs) You ever felt that way? (laughs) Does that ever come across in your mind where you think, I am so done with these obnoxious individuals? The truth is that many of us here are overworked, we're tired, and we're fed up, and you combine that with selfishness, And here comes this thing called irritability in our lives. One of America's greatest theologians, his name was uh, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, You you know that I I like him. I've quoted him many times since I've been here. And 
One of his daughters was known for being irritable and even having a violent uh, 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 temper. And a young man in their area had fallen in love with his daughters and came to uh, ask Edward for a hand in marriage. And Edward said, no, you can't marry her. And he sought an explanation. Why, Why can't I marry her? And he replied, she is not worthy of you, young man. That's a bold statement coming from a dad. And he said, why? Is she not a Christian? Edward said, yes, she is. But the grace of God can live with some people with whom no one else could ever live. (laughs) That's a rough statement, isn't it? Oftentimes, I, I, I pray that I don't become like that where just the grace of God can take me. But that where, whatever my circumstances may be, that I'm considerate of other people, that I'm not explosive, that I'm not volatile, that I'm not being irritated. And, and instead of loving people, despite all of their shortcomings and, and their problems, that we could look at them and, and we could uh, not be easily provoked to anger. And we let everyone na- around us know, you know, I'm just irritated with you. That's not the way of agape. You know, the reality is, we are going to have irritating people in our lives. We're, we're going to be surrounded by irritating people. I call them EGRs. You all know what EGRs are? They're, they're extra grace required people, right? Do you have some EGRs? Uh, the other one I call them is the uh, EBHs, emotional black holes. You know, where they're just constantly sucking the emotions out of you. And, and if you hang out with them for a long time, they, they just be, you just become irritated with them. But what I've discovered about these individuals in my life is that I think that God allows those type of people in my life for me to show me that I need to continue to work in the way of agape. That, that he need, he's showing me that I need to be continually transformed. And, and then secondly, I think that there are less EGR people around us than we think. We are just more irritable than we should be. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> that, that? It might not be the other individuals. It might actually be us and being overly irritated. And so, beloved, if you are here and you have a lot of irritating people in your life, Maybe you should start looking at your own life and see if you are highly irritable and we need to be transformed in the way of agape. In fact, notice how the Lord responded to EGR people. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. It says, when he was reviled, he lost it. Did it say that? No, it didn't say that. It says, he did not revile in return. And, and when he suffered, he was so upset doesn't say that either. He says, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He, he didn't become irritable. Notice how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 12, verse 16. It says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing uh, to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Don't repay anyone with evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, look at this part. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, even the irritable people. Notice what he says. As far as it depends on you, he puts a lot of the responsibility back at where? On us. When it comes to irritable people, living in harmony, it, 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 it comes back to me. See, I put the third thing on your outline this morning. Jot it down. If I'm living the agape way, I won't be easily irritated. I won't be easily irritated. That's not what love does, and when this happens, I can almost assure you that agape flaw is coming to the surface, and we need to constantly be coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm irritable today. Give me your agape. I need your agape. Transform me in agape that I can love in the way of otherness today, even when I'm not feeling it. Last thought here this morning as we come to our 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Notice what it says. It says it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or 
resentful. Now, I like some other translations that instead of resentful, it says, it does not keep a record of wrongs. So let's do that one. Jesus doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Chad doesn't keep a record of wrongs. One, two, three. Okay. See, when it comes to agape, it doesn't store a list of grievances on our mental hard drive of all the things that people have done to you. Now, earlier this year, uh, a flash drive came out that stores uh, this size, stores four terabytes of information. Four terabytes. You know what that is? That's a, a half a million books. I mean, you could fill up this whole area and put it all in this little flash drive. You can store a lot in these things. Isn't it amazing? I mean, on my phone, I have thousands of pictures and thousands of songs and, and all this information on these little things. And I've often thought, you know, this brain of ours, it's constantly storing data. And for some of us, it's storing all the wrongs that people have done to us. And we have it on our hard drive, and every now and then we insert it into the mental sort of computer of our minds and, and go through those things that have been done to us and we relive them over and over again. It's amazing. I can forget my keys 20 minutes ago where I put them. <laughs> but then I can remember things that happened 20 days ago or 20 years ago of the things that people have done to me. And, and we hold on to those on our mental hard drive. And yet it says here that love doesn't keep a record of those wrongs. In fact, if you look at the Greek word here, it is an accounting word. I know we have a lot of accountants in this church who look over every peso and every centavo to keep track of it. And, and what Paul is saying here is that love is, if you are a person of agape, you will not be a very good accountant when it comes to remembering the wrongs that have been done against you. You will lose some things along the way, and that's a good thing for agape, to lose wrongs that have been given or done against you. See, agape doesn't keep a record of wrongs. When I was working on my dissertation, I came across a tribe in India uh, that I read about. Uh, uh, Indonesia, I'm sorry, not India. And they had in their tribe, in order to make them better warriors, they would, every time somebody did something wrong to them, they would create these little trinkets. And they'd put it on their necklace. And they would wear this necklace of all the things that people had done wrong to them. And then when they would go to war, they would sort of remember the things on their necklace. And it would make them all frenzied and angry, and they would be stronger warriors. Now, that sounds fairly primitive, doesn't it? We do it. Oh, we don't wear necklaces, but we have it in our mental hard drive. And we kind of get worked up, and we get in a frenzy of all the things that people have done wrong to us. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Maybe it's a parent or a boss or a coach that was unfair. Maybe there's a prejudice or partiality that brought pain in your life. Maybe it's a neighbor who uh, treated you rudely or a friend that turned on us. Paul reminds us here that people who are filled with love and a church that is filled with love doesn't keep the records of wrongs. 2001, a, a, a brief hour-long movie came out. It was called Dead Drunk. It's the story of a guy by the name of Kevin Tunnell, who was required to mail a dollar check for 18 years every week of his life. It's an odd, odd thing to happen. In fact, he was went, taken to court and sued for $1.5 million, but he settled for $936 as long as he wrote a $1 check every week to the suing family. Well, what had happened, he had, when he was 17 years old, he had gotten drunk and he was driving and he killed a seven, an 18-year-old girl who was part of this family. And so the family said, we want you for 18 years, every year of her life, to write us a check of $1 a week, remembering what you have done. Very interesting, isn't it? Uh, he had gone to prison. He even spent seven years campaigning against drunk driving, invested much of his life in campaigning against drunk driving, and, and several times he forgot to send the check because he was so busy, and they took him to court. You forgot the check. 
He said, I will give you, you know, a hundred other checks for a dollar if, if you will just lift this. And they said, no, we want you to remember every week. What's interesting about that, though, is one author wrote this. Few people would question the anger of this family and their grief. But are 936 payments enough? When they receive the final payment, will they be able to put the matter to rest? Is 18 years worth of restitution sufficient? This family had sentenced themselves to a life of private haunting. They were the ongoing victims, and every Friday for 18 years, they suffered all over again. Sounded good at the first, but really, when we don't forget, we are suffering the affliction over and over and over again. And that's why the Lord says, the way of agape is the way of forgetfulness in many ways. In fact, if you look at what Paul the Peter says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, says, above all, keep loving one another. Keep agapeing one another. And notice what happens when you're agapeing one another. Agape covers a multitude of sins. And I wonder this morning if there are people that are keeping record of the things that have been done wrong to them, if they're reliving them over and over again. Alan Redpath in his commentary on this says, it does not keep a record of wrongs. It is suffered with a view to getting even. It does not cherish in its memory a list of injustices. Love has an amazing power to forget. Now notice this. The Lord Jesus came to blot out our transgressions and to remember them against us no more forever. Do you know what Jesus came to do? The way of agape is the fact that you and I, we have all sinned against the Lord. We have all committed transgressions and yet The way of agape or the way of Jesus is a way of forgetfulness. In fact, if you look at uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, 34, it says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God here is choosing willfully to forget the grievances against him. That is the way of agape. In fact, it says in, in Micah that he throws the sins where? To the bottom of the ocean floor. Can you imagine that? Your sins... Everything that you've ever done wrong, he doesn't replay it in the mental hard drive of his mind. He forgets about it and he throws it in the bottom of the ocean floor. Now, there are two things with that. If your sins are forgiven, beloved, know that you are forgiven and stop living in guilt because he has forgiven them. And some of us, we go scuba diving, right? Oh, look at the sins. I've got to bring that one back up. Stop. It's forgiven. That is, our intuition says that God hasn't forgotten because that's what we are. But God has forgotten them. And so we try, try and bring them up again and again. That's not the way of agape. But secondly, if that's the way of the Lord, there are probably some things that you need to forget for other individuals as well following the way of agape. We need to be people of forgetfulness when it comes to our relationships with others. Last thing in your outline, jot it down this morning. If I'm living the way of agape, I won't be a good accountant. I won't be a good accountant. I'm gonna forget some things. I'm gonna lose some, some, some sins. I'm gonna lose some offenses along the way. This is the way of agape, the way of otherness. There's an old fable I came across in my studies from different cultures It's a fable from India that goes back over 100 years. And and really, it's quite graphic, but it conveys a powerful message and really embraces a lot of what we're talking about here in Agape. It's the story of a young man who fell madly in love with a woman in a neighboring village. And she didn't reciprocate his affection in any way whatsoever, but she liked toying with him and liked the notion of somebody being madly in love with her And so she was constantly asking for more things. If you love me, you'll do this for me. If you love me, you'll do this for me. And the the young man was ready to accommodate all of them. And and these requests were getting more and more outrageous until one day the, the lady knew that she did not want to marry this young man. And so she thought of the most offensive thing that she could possibly think of. And she said, if you want to marry me, I don't want to have any rivalries I want to be the exclusive love in your life. You need to go to your mother, kill her, take her heart out, 
and bring it to me. Pretty gruesome story, isn't it? A fable, not real, okay? <laughs> bring it to me. Ah, oh, the young man's conflicted. What do I do? Oh, my heart is for this woman. I want her to be my wife, but I love my mother. What, what do I do? And he wrestled with it for several weeks until one morning on a weekend day, a moment of weakness, he saw his mom all by herself. And in a frenzy of passion, he went over and he killed her. He cut out the heart and he went running as fast as he could to the neighboring village with the heart in his hand. And as he was running, he lost sight of the road in front of him and there was a vine in the jungle and he tripped over the vine and, and, and as he tripped, the, the, the heart went flying into the bushes and he fell down on his face and on his legs and, and he couldn't find the heart and as he's getting up, he saw that his legs were all bloodied and his elbows were bloodied and his face was bloody and he starts rummaging through the bushes trying to find the heart to bring to the woman and he finally finds it and he picks it up and he dusts himself off and he looks at his wounds and then he hears the voice from the heart saying, son, are you hurt? Are you okay? And at that moment, he knew what love was. <laughs> That's really the way of agape, isn't it? The way of otherness. Not the things that we desire, not the wants that we have, but that we are considering the other people around us. That we look at the world around us and we say, are you okay? Or as my daughter said, I figured I needed to be a better person, so I'm going to consider someone else. That's the way of agape. Now, beloved, are you walking in the way of agape? Listen, nobody here is perfect. Believe you me, as we look at this, we've all found our flaws, haven't we? But we come to this and we say, Lord, make me a person of agape this morning. Transform me to be more like you. Let's pray together this morning. As you look introspectively at your own life, pray a prayer something like this. Lord, give me more of your agape. That's what we should take away from this text. That's what we should take away from each week of our studies. Lord, I, I need to be more like you. And so, Father, we come to you this morning, collectively as your church, asking you to transform us in the way of agape, the agape way, Lord, that we would be in the way of otherness as we consider the people around us. We ask this in your name. Amen.